We have Tor Bear here. Tor Bear is the founder of Secret Foundation and the former head of growth for Secret Labs. He has worked full time on scaling the secret ecosystem for the past five years. Tor is a former data scientist, options trader, and MIT graduate who is passionate about privacy solutions and onboarding billions of users securely into Web3. Let's give it up for Tor. Hello, MIT. We're kicking off right at 420. I'm sure this was intentional. Uh, for those of you who stayed here, it's clear that you preserve uh, privacy as your preference because the other panel that's going on right now is about regulation. So if you're here, you're pro-privacy. I don't know what it means if you left, uh, but we're about to have fun uh, with this one. So I'm Tor, I'm the founder of Secret Foundation. I work on Secret Network. There's like exactly one slide in this presentation about Secret Network. All of the rest is around the importance of privacy, why you should care. It's the message that you're gonna take home and like give to all your friends about why this is the part of the crypto ecosystem they should care about. And it's pretty much the part that it started with, the part that we're supposed to be building permissionless systems that are more empowering, that protect users globally. This is the part we don't wanna lose while we're doing all of the other stuff like regulating it and scaling it and everything else. So my only hope is that you walk away, if you remember nothing about Secret, I mean, Remember at least the importance of privacy. Use some of the language that I'm gonna break it down into because this is how we're gonna do that storytelling. Uh, so on your programs, such as it is, it probably says something like the importance of privacy for Web3. I have this titled Privacy for the Metaverse now. It's kind of the same thing, but this is a little bit buzzier. Web3's out, Metaverse is in. Tell your VCs. Um, this presentation is meant to be interactive if you see Mark Zuckerberg, feel free to boo or cheer. Um, and if anything is inspiring you to do anything else, we have time for question at the end. But it's supposed to be engaging, right? I don't know how many of these you've seen today. Um, this one is not terribly technical, but it's very ethos driven, so I hope it's meaningful for many of you who have chosen to stay for this. Here's my one slide as promised on secret. So as I said, or as was said in the introduction, uh, I've been working on this ecosystem for the last five years when it was like three of us. Uh, now it's many, many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of users. So secret is a layer one blockchain. We do privacy preserving smart contracts. So it's not like transactional privacy alone where it's like I need to get money from point A to point B and I don't want people to know. It's a much more encompassing vision around how can we create a decentralized web where all of the applications I'm going to be using have privacy by default, protect data at their core. And it's something that's kind of been lost in the entire shuffle of blockchain space within the like DeFi speculation and NFT speculation and everything else. Fundamentally, we want to enable the types of applications that do preserve privacy and that do empower, and we want them to be built on secret. Uh, we've been live on mainnet with the tech since 2020. We have dozens of live dApps across all these different verticals. We're part of the Cosmos ecosystem, like the lovely Terra people you saw speak earlier. We love Terra, we love stable coins, we love decentralization. Uh, we could show a bunch of adoption metrics. I only put two, you know, we have tons of unique addresses and users. We have historical volume, like people use this today. There's probably a lot of things you'd see like come and stand up here and say, someday we'll have this. What I'm saying is, and the reason I'm saying this up front, this is not going to be pie in the sky. This is stuff you can care about now. And by building on secret or building with secret or any other privacy tech in the web three space, you're showing that you care about it now, not that distant future where this is going to matter because it matters today. So I hope that at the end of this presentation, you start building things today that are gonna take advantage of privacy by default because those are the same things we're still gonna be using in a decade or more. And I'm not so sure about the other stuff. You'll, you'll see why. But anyways, let's dive in uh, with the most important question of all. Like what even is privacy? Why did I put it on my hat? Like what's the whole point? Um, so when I made this presentation originally, the first version of this presentation, at least this ethos part, I gave uh, in like late 2018 or something like that. And at the time, I you know, needed to generate all of my source images. My main source for those source images was like Unsplash, right? You go, you wanna get a bunch of stock photography, let, let's go get it. So I typed in privacy. I really wanted to know what was gonna come up. And here's what I got. So if this is any indication, privacy is a bunch of cameras and it's uh, Facebook watching you through binoculars. Uh, I think that's like a mail slot in the upper left. But the point being like, none of this is actually like privacy, right? What you're seeing is surveillance. This didn't make any sense to me. People think privacy, 
like when they, when they try to visualize it, they're visualizing it by kind of showing its antithesis. Like the right to privacy, what is that? Is it just the right not to be surveilled? Then why is this the image that comes up when we talk about privacy? What should come up when we talk about privacy? Like what's the point? So I was like, I know what it is. None of these really have people in them as the subject of the photo. So I was like, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna type in privacy human, and that's gonna get me what I want. And this is what came up. These are privacy humans. This is what everybody who cares about privacy looks like, right? They've got their cool hoodie. They stand in front of like either extremely darkly lit or extremely brightly lit rooms. And this is, this is how they have fun, right? They just kind of stand around and stand in contrast to their backgrounds. Like this is nonsense, right? We all care about privacy about something in our lives. Apple did me a huge favor and did a multi-million dollar marketing campaign showing people jogging around shouting about their credit card numbers. And that was really nice of them because it pointed out all of us have something that's worth protecting even if it seems trivial because there's certain things that we want some people to know and not others. So then why when we're saying privacy human are these the only images that pop up? Why is this the only thing I find when I try to explain through visual imagery why privacy is important to people and why we should care about it for Web3 applications? So instead of using images because that was fruitless, uh, I decided I would try to at least define what privacy wasn't with words. And the images helped me think of that, right? It's not just having something to hide. It's not wanting to be alone and isolated. It's not acting suspicious when people are asking you questions. It's not painting with super dark colors. You know, there, it, it's so much more than that. But we can only start to understand what privacy is once we start to say, like, we have to first agree that all these images we're seeing about privacy are not privacy. Many of them are the opposite of privacy, like the ones we just saw. The one thing, I got a little bit closer there. The one thing that you should know about privacy is that it is a human right. And everybody in this room has that right to privacy. And everybody in this room has the ability to help protect it, either through what we build or through what we use. So I'll, I'm gonna break privacy down in this presentation basically into three pillars, and these are words, not images, but we're gonna talk about each of these pillars in depth, and they are consent, freedom, and sustainability. And that last one is the one that I don't hear talked about enough. But when we're building in the Web3 space and we're talking about what systems are still gonna exist in a decade or two decades or more, and we've built a bunch of stuff that's only really existed for a decade or less, you know, why aren't we talking more about what it's gonna take to be here in a decade or more? And why aren't we talking about like what are the fundamental properties of those kinds of systems? Well, privacy is one. And by the end of this, I'll explain why. Let's start with that first pillar, privacy as consent. So let's define consent. I think we can define each of these pillars a little bit better than we can define privacy. We said what privacy wasn't, but I think we know a little bit about what each of those pillars actually are in the positive space, not the negative space. So consent, and again, we can quibble with the definitions, but these are pretty good places to start. Agreeing to what can be done with our information. But you can only agree if you also have knowledge about what you're agreeing to. You're informed about the actual nature of your agreement. And just because you sign the terms and conditions doesn't mean you're actually informed. It could be complete legal garbage, and then you find out that you've signed away your life. Like, I don't just mean like somebody tried to tell you. I mean like actually understanding what's being done with your information. The thing is that violations of our privacy are actually violations, a lot of the time, of our consent. And it's a lot easier for us to feel violations of our consent. A lot of us in this room likely know how that feels for whatever reason. And you can feel that on a much deeper emotional level than a violation of your privacy, which can happen out of sight, out of mind, passively, slowly, or quickly. But violations of consent are very visceral and very personal, but they're very, very tightly related. So when I first gave this presentation, again, the first version of this presentation, this was really new news. Anybody not heard about this yet? Good. Uh, this was kind of big news, Cambridge Analytica and the whistleblowers. This wasn't even just like, they had multiple whistleblowers, right? But here's one. All the data being taken without authorization, harvesting the profiles, using for them for like political retargeting campaigns, swaying elections, undermining democracy. You know, this was actually really frightening when it was first news. And now we're just like, yeah, we knew that. It's like, I don't think we really did know that, or at least it hadn't sunk in. 
because it was so perniciously passive. The way that this kind of snuck up on us over time, the slow deterioration of democracy through social platforms that were just letting us play Farmville. Like, we didn't know. But now, like, we're, now that we're like swimming in that water all the time, we're like, oh yeah, of course every Web2 platform works that way. We always knew that, and that was just part of the bargain. Like, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, and that's cool. This was not cool, this was never cool. But we all kind of had to accept it after the fact because it had already happened. The rabbit was out of the hat, the cat was out of the bag, what could you do? The thing is, how could we prevent it from happening again? If you want to prevent something, you have to be able to assign responsibility. You have to know who was responsible for whatever breach of consent this was. None of us consented for our data to be used in this way. And if we had consented, you know, we certainly didn't intend for it to be used in the way that it eventually was used. Every step that the data was removed from its original point of collection was an even greater violation of the original consent. But who's responsible for this? Is it Facebook, the platform? Is it the individual application on Facebook that allowed the data to be leaked and misused? Was it the users who originally may, maybe short-sightedly or unknowingly consented to give their data? Was it their fault for being stupid? Was it the government's fault for not having tighter regulations on all of this stuff? The problem is we couldn't answer this question because none of us even knew how Facebook worked. This was the first time we figured out that Facebook even did this stuff at all. This was the first time we figured out that other people had access to this data outside of just Facebook. And then we found out they had financial relationships with all of these companies. Like that was out of sight, out of mind for the vast majority of the billions of users on Facebook and all of its platforms. So there's an irony here. Solving this problem of privacy actually is a transparency problem. The systems weren't transparent. We didn't know how any of this worked. How are we supposed to even start solving the privacy problem if we didn't know who was responsible for all the problems in the first place. How do we fix the systems if we can't see how they all interconnect? Because they were so black box, because they were part of these corporate relationships, we didn't see it happening until it was too late. Privacy problems often start because we don't understand how privacy is being eroded before we even get to the point where it's gone. So there's a fundamental question here tying consent and privacy together. How do you consent then to what you can't understand or can't observe? And then how do you even regulate something like that? Right? How do you regulate something like Facebook if you don't even know how Facebook works or if Facebook doesn't even know how itself works? If they build a bunch of AI black boxes and they're like, we, we don't really know how these algorithms work. We can't regulate them either. What are you gonna do? Well, I'll tell you what they tried to do. Uh, feel free to boo. Yeah, good enough. So uh, Zuck asked people to regulate Facebook. Madness, why would he do that? Why would he do that? Facebook made so much money in a massive business in their current state. Why would they want more regulation? Well, I, I broke it down into easy steps at least. So step one, and I'm gonna read this verbatim because it's really fun to say fast. Grow to truly massive size, creating an incredibly complex and opaque system that creates huge negative externalities for billions of consumers, each with no visibility into the magnitude of the problems created. That was step one. Step two is also pretty fun. Profit. It's always a good step in the, in the Web2 world, and they definitely profited, but they weren't done. There's more steps. Step three, get caught being unable to defend their misuse of user data. Step four, use said profits to influence governments claiming only you understand the problem that you originally created. And then finally, work with regulators to create rules that only you can follow because you're capitalized to do it or because only you understand the systems well enough to implement the regulations once they're made. And then you crush your competition. And that is regulatory capture. And this is the dominant Web2 business model. This is the dominant like everything business model, like rent seeking regulatory capture. But this makes it really plain why Facebook would even want regulation after they did all this cool stuff with your data. So why do we still, yeah, thank you. So why do we still care about this? So what I love about this picture is you can't tell by looking at it whether Mark Zuckerberg is trying to gift you the metaverse or whether he's trying to absorb all of your data actively into his metaverse. Just don't look at his eyes. The point is, they're not done. And the reason I retitled this really as privacy for the metaverse and not privacy for Web3, et cetera, is because they wanna own the metaverse. They wanna own the damn word. 
They put it in their name or vice versa. And that's not okay because they're just going to do it again. They already have a strategy. They showed it to you. Why are you going to let them do the exact same thing? So we have to defend privacy for the metaverse because Facebook wants to do it their way. And if we let them win, then this is the image you get. Mark's sucking your data forever. So we don't often feel privacy violations, but we do feel violations of our consent. And if you forget what feeling violated can feel like, just look at this picture a little longer. But that's the point. Some things are very visceral when you break them down. You realize what's actually been done to you. And then it's very emotional. And then you realize it was a violation of our consent. We didn't agree to this to be done to our data. We didn't agree to the consequences for democracy and society. But this is what we got. And it was a privacy violation as well. Now we're moving on to freedom, which is another fun one. So. Uh, this is from Privacy International. It's pretty easy to just take this stuff verbatim because it's so good. We have the right to maintain a private life and communications, but mass surveillance is used to suppress speech. Platforms and governments can work together in maintaining the suppression, even if they do so indirectly. And even when we are told to express ourselves freely, the whole point of requiring privacy for freedom is we are not protected from the consequences of that expression. We're told to be ourselves. We're told to do whatever we want. What happens if what we want to be is not what society is allowing us to be in that moment in our way. Without the rights of privacy, even if we're told we can be free, there are consequences to trying to act with freedom. This is my definition for freedom. Again, we can wiggle, but this is pretty good. The power to, and right to act and speak and think as you desire, and the freedom to pursue happiness maybe sounds familiar, you know, America-wise, but we don't necessarily guarantee you're gonna be happy. We just say you're free to pursue it in acting and speaking and thinking how you wish. So privacy is essential not only to individual freedom, but I want you to think for a second about how it's essential to our collective freedom. The ability for all of us to form private communities, to self-organize, to speak freely in those communities without fear of persecution. By creating those collective freedoms, we maintain and we preserve our individual freedoms, which allow us to develop an identity that gets expressed collectively. So, Here's the false choice we have to be aware of. States tell us that stability can't be ensured if anonymous online expression is unregulated, that communications must be visible by the state in order to prevent terrorism and cybercrime, and that interactivity without observability would lead to illegality. And these are fundamentally false choices that you should reject. Because expressing our rights of privacy means expressing our freedom to speak publicly. Remember the slide where I was like, what is privacy not? Well, it's not hiding in the corner. It's not sitting in the dark like that you know, masked guy. It's not a bunch of cameras. What it is is just privacy is protecting our individual freedom, which gives us the freedom to express ourselves publicly. People don't understand that we want our privacy that we can, so that we can be public figures. If we don't have any privacy, that constant state of surveillance causes us to retreat further into ourselves. We become more private people because we cannot express our true selves publicly. The death of privacy is that death of individuality and freedom. And this is the irony that's kind of behind that. So if you're ever asked yourself, like, if, if you're the kind of person who ever had to ask yourself these questions, right? Like, you, you might be that kind of person, especially if you're still at this talk. What, websites you visit, books you read, items you buy, who you speak to, who you love, any of this. Like, and you ask yourself, what would they do if they knew? It doesn't matter who they is or any of this stuff, right? Just I'm not going to answer this because the thing is, Facebook already knows. You already told them. You told Facebook for a decade exactly who you were in a relationship with. You clicked on like 70 different pages that said exactly what you like. And now everybody knows. Once you told everybody, they knew. Even if you changed, even if your identity changed, now everybody thinks that's you. And a thousand different surveillance applications are going to pretend that's you for the rest of time. The lack of privacy is also a lack of freedom to change your identity to evolve, especially if you feel like if your identity evolves publicly, you're violating some expectation of you. And the more surveillance we have, and the more accountability built on top of that surveillance, the more that freedom to evolve, to change, to exist, to collect ourselves just deteriorates to nothing. So I, I think we had like a little bit of a CBDC panel earlier today as well. Um, this is an old article, but it's already now, right? 
What are central banks going to do with their money, their centralized state money? Are they going to prioritize privacy? In all the polls they do of people who live in these countries, all these people are saying, we would love the rights of privacy to be enshrined in our tech. But not every country has said, we actually are going to have privacy in our CBDCs. They don't have to do what we say. Once they do it, we can't necessarily vote them out. Fed is not exactly an elected body. So what's going to happen? We have to be concerned. I'm going to move ahead. We'll do our last pillar, because then if there's any questions, I want to make sure we do it before bleeding too heavily into the break. So privacy is sustainability. There's one key point to this one. So I'll zoom ahead just by saying, like, I think we kind of understand sustainability. We want to create sustainable systems that can maintain balance instead of being in a cycle of complete insatiable growth constantly. And it means increasing the resilience of those systems that we're relying on, creating feedback systems that can stabilize them over time that aren't like soul crushingly or energy crushingly intensive. Systems cannot provide privacy. Systems, sorry, systems that cannot provide privacy are not sustainable for the people in them. That's the fundamental point I wanna make about sustainability and privacy. That's the main link. Because if you don't have privacy in a system, it's the people that won't survive that system. Other things might, but the humans in those systems will not. Who knows this quote? Information wants to be free. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this. Few people, sweet. Did you know there's another half to this quote? Information also wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. These were said in the same breath by Stuart Brand. And the reason that he said this is because the cost of acquiring data is decreasing dramatically, and the value of the data is increasing dramatically. So it's super cheap to collect, especially if you're Facebook. And then it's super expensive to repackage, remonetize where the user becomes the product. And that entire value gap between the cost of creating the data and then the value of repackaging, remonetizing the data, that's all producer surplus, not consumer surplus. Users don't get any of that. That's all Facebooks, and they want it forever, right? That's the whole point of the regulatory capture. That is a massive disparity, and they want it all. And they don't want to give it to you. I mean, I'm singling them out a lot in this presentation, but you can replace that company name with a lot of Web2 company names. Uh, oh, sorry, also a bunch of Web3 company names because this exact thing happens in crypto too. The cost of creating on-chain data is constantly falling because we just do it all the time. Everything is public by default on all of these different networks, secret excluded, right? Ethereum, Solana, Terra, everything works the same way. Everything is public on the chain. So you're constantly creating data, constantly. These are the kinds of companies that are capturing that value. The miners are extracting that value. That's what MEV is. The fact that all this data is being generated passively and they know what to do with it that you don't. You don't get that value as a user. In fact, you lose a lot. You lose billions from MEV. And uh, apologies to any chain analysis people in the room, but this is not the way I wanted crypto unicorns to be built. The rest of that quote is, it is the people who really want to be free. So if you ever hear that quote again, remember the rest of it. There's always going to be this inherent tension. As long as data is being created and we're just going to share it for free and get nothing as consumers, there's always going to be this tension between the fact that it's cheap to create and super valuable to the people who are in the best position to repackage it into a product. So unsustainable doesn't mean something that can't be sustained ever. I think all these Web2 systems are completely unsustainable uh, in a sense because they're incredibly energy intensive to maintain. Zuck is going to throw billions of dollars at trying to make a regulatory capture metaverse. That doesn't mean it won't work. It just means it's going to be super energy intensive. But why are they doing it? Because it's obviously worth at least that much to them to try. So what does that tell you about the value of your data in this ecosystem? What does that tell you about how valuable it's going to be to have privacy for your own information and for your own rights in Web3? Fundamentally, it's worth expending that substantial energy as Facebook when those rewards become too valuable to ignore. So don't ignore them. Data's the new oil, right? This is the sustainability argument, right? If data's the new oil and we're going to like strip mine the world, think about it. Think about sustainability the same way we have to in the energy universe. And think about it when you're thinking about your privacy. We've been destroying the economic environment through negative externalities for the people who have to live in these ecosystems. And we don't have to make that mistake in Web3 if we choose to build privacy by default. 
So these are your pillars again. If you didn't take a picture before, feel free or just kind of remember consent, freedom, sustainability, break it down. If people don't understand why privacy, ask them why consent, why freedom, why sustainability. Chances are someone you know cares at least a little bit about one or all of those pillars, even if they don't understand privacy. Because it's not just one thing. Here's, here's like the end of the Apple commercial, right? Privacy isn't one thing, it's everything. Uh, take a picture of this too, please reach out. Uh, so with the foundation, what I do is I work with builders, I work with community members. Like you don't have to be a developer, you can just be an evangelist, you can be somebody who wants to be a part of what is now a global community. They're called secret agents, that's the last link there. We got like 30,000 people around the world who are helping us do this kind of evangelism, educational work, awareness work. We have an international growth committee that goes to conferences around the world. I go to the ones that let me come back to MIT, yes. Uh, but I will also be in Austin next month for consensus and some of those conferences. Try to find me there, try to find me here. We do give away these hats. I only brought this one. But if you're coming to Austin, find me. I will get you your own privacy hat and I hope you wear it all the time and I hope you remember why. Um, but please reach out to me. Any, uh, any of this works. I do check my Twitter DMs. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you guys.